start off with we've been revisiting the theft removal borrowing if you will according to your perspective of the Indian head rock out of the Ohio River between uh, South Shore Kentucky and Portsmouth Ohio by Steve Schaefer and Dave Vetter back in late 2007 and the trial that followed so we're just kind of revisiting folks that were involved and, and kind of the sides of you know, what happened, how did it become such an issue with the mainstream media, and now why does uh, The Rock reside in, a, in a, a relatively sad location. But had you ever heard of Indian Head Rock before it was removed from the river? Uh, I had not, because uh, it's not something that was in my research interests. At what point was the Indian Head Rock documented or recorded as a Kentucky artifact? Well, you know, it gets recorded as an archaeological site in uh, 1978, but it's, it was known to archaeologists since the early 1800s because it's mentioned in a Squire and Davis's survey uh, of the Ohio Valley. So this, it's been known as an archaeological site, as an archaeological resource for almost 200 years. One of the arguments Steve Schaefer's defense tried to make was it was more of a historical item to the city of Portsmouth, Ohio, than it was to Kentucky. Do you have any take on that? Was it more of a Kentucky historical item or, or Ohio? I, and I don't, I don't think it's something that either uh, state can really make a claim to as more important to. You know, I think it, you know, to Native Americans it was probably an important spot too because it's a prominent spot on the river. So it would have been a landmark for people when they traveled the river. So to say that it's more important to one than the other, uh, I, I think misses the point. When you first heard of the rock being removed from the Ohio River, what were your first thoughts? Well, it was a, it was the thought of uh, the typical kind of uh, site destruction, looting that you see of people going and taking uh, materials from a site without really thinking about what they were doing and why they're doing it. Um, what did you think the Ohio folks, when they, when they were, what did you think they were going to do with it? Did you have any idea? We had no idea. Uh, they, they, there was some talk initially that they were going to put it in a museum, they were going to have this big exhibit, but we had really no idea what they were do, going to do with it. And, the more we got into it, the more we realized that they really did not have a clear plan. So how long after it was removed did, uh, did your office get notified and, and of course uh, stuff started moving pretty quickly with the Heritage Council and things like that? Uh, fairly soon afterwards, I couldn't give you the exact date, but I would say within a few weeks, you know, uh, one of the things that alerted everybody to it is, uh, as you probably know, they uh, posted uh, YouTube videos of them doing it. So once you had the videos and you could see that, then it became pretty clear uh, that, that what, what had gone on. So at what point did Dwight Cropper become involved? Uh, Dwight became involved early on because I think, you know, he may have been the one that actually informed us uh, that this had occurred. So he, he, you know, Dwight has been quite active in uh, historic preservation and archaeology in the Greenham County area since probably since he was a teenager. Uh, his family was instrumental in getting the sites on their property nominated to the National Register. They protected archaeological sites on their property and throughout the county. Were the carvings or etchings on the rock of Indian origin? Well, that, you know, there's some that's basically graffiti, historic graffiti, and then, you know, you have the face. and. You know, there is some question among uh, people as to whether or not it is of Indian origin. I tend to fall in the camp that it probably is, and I also fall in the camp that it should be considered until you can prove otherwise. So who was Fred Coy? We interviewed Steve Schaefer. He talked about Fred Coy. We interviewed Bob Maslowski last week. He mentioned Fred Coy. So who was Fred Coy, and uh, why was the... Oh, Steve Schaefer's defense trying to use Fred Coy as a person of interest when it comes to their defense of removing the rock. Well, well Fred was a Louisville doctor 
who along with a friend of his named uh, Tom Fuller got interested in rock art. And so they started going out and visiting sites uh, and documenting these sites. They then worked with an archaeologist out of uh, Pittsburgh named Jim Swagger who got a grant from the Kentucky Heritage Council to go out and document these sites. And so they worked with him, shared their information with him, and then together they, uh, they published a book. So uh, Steve knew, Steve had actually gone to some rock art meetings and he had, you know, he was active within that community so he knew Fred and he knew Fred had some expertise on the subject so that's one of the reasons he invited Fred to come down and, and look at the rock. Um, when the charges were first levied against Steve Schaefer for removing the rock, what was your role in the proceedings after the trials began? Uh, I didn't really didn't have much of a role. Again, we, we provided information uh, to Cliff Duvall, the, uh, the Commonwealth Attorney, but we weren't really at, hadn't got to the point where any of us uh, at the Heritage Council at the time were going to be had been called to testify. Well, but speaking of Cliff Duvall, perfect segue here. Uh, we interviewed him a few weeks back, and he said Kentucky had a terrible looting problem when it comes to archaeological sites, and he thought this would be a great example to say, "Don't do this. Don't be like Mr. Schaefer." Um, does Kentucky still have a looting problem of sites, and, and especially you know, artifacts, things like that? Yes. I mean, and so does Ohio, so does, so, do, so does West Virginia, so do most states. Uh, looting of archaeological sites is an ongoing problem, and even though it is against federal law to do it on federal lands and state uh, lands, it's still an ongoing issue, and it oftentimes is tied to the economy. When the economy's going good, there's less looting. When the economy's going bad, you know, there's more looting because, again, you can go out and you can, a lot of people go out and uh, take the artifacts and sell them. <coughs> who, who buys those artifacts? Museums and private no, collectors? Uh, private collectors. I'm sorry. <coughs> no, there's a demand among private collectors as far away as, way as Japan. Uh, but no, and there's a market for these. Uh, you can go to Indian artifact shows. You can go online and see it. Um, so there is there is a market. People will pay a lot of money uh, for it. And so, uh, if you're unemployed, sometimes it, the lure of that uh, gets you out there. A lot of the people involved in looting do other illegal things too. Uh, so it's just one of the many things they do. And then there is a group that does it just to build their collection. They want, you know, they want to have the best collection, they want to have a private collection, so there's a variety of reasons, but yes, it, it is still a, a problem. It's a problem throughout the United States. So after the charges were dropped against Schaefer and a peaceful accord uh, was drafted to get the rock back to Kentucky, did Kentucky have any plan at that point in the state to do anything with the rock? Well, there, there were there were ideas that were floated and uh, try to you know maybe put it at a uh, Greenbow Lake State Park, uh, try to put it somewhere in Reno County and build some sort of a shelter. Uh, the problems came back up with who was going to pay for that, how it was going to be done, which was the same basic problem that Ohio faced if they were going to keep the rock and do the rock. How are you going to do it? How are you going to preserve it? You know, one of the things they never considered is when you took that rock out of the water, what was going to happen to it? You know, what happens to that rock that's been emerged in water, you take it out of the water, and is it going to deteriorate? How do you preserve it? What's the best climate? You know, none of those things were done. And so Ohio would face the same problem. I suspect if it was in Ohio today, it would still be in the garage there waiting for somebody to figure out where they were going to find the money to do it and, and how are you going to have a long-term plan for, for inter interpreting and maintaining it. So what, what happens to sandstone after it, it's submerged for who knows how many years, but after it's been out and dried out? That's a good question. Uh, and, you know, no, not knowing the type of sandstone, the environment, 
you know, that's not a question I could answer. That's a, and that's something that somebody needed to have have researched and come up with a plan. So, so we're here. We're coming up on almost ten years after Schaefer and his uh, crew removed the rock from the river. What's your thoughts on Indian Head Rock now, almost ten years later? Well, it's you know the same basic uh, issues of it's a, it's a case study of how you know, how not to plan, how not to coordinate. You know, if Steve Schaefer had wanted to do this and he had actually gone through the proper process of applying for a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers and then having that permit sent out for people to review. The first questions people would have said, okay, what's your plan? What are you going to do with it? Uh, how are you going to preserve it? And he would have had to have come up with some plan. Had to have, the city of Portsmouth, if they were really serious, would have had to hire somebody to do that. Everybody would have sat down. Everybody would have said, okay, great. Well, here's our comments on the plan. Here's our concern. Work on an agreement. And everybody would have been happy. Uh, I think the, the ultimate with the, the state of Kentucky would have loaned it to the city of Portsmouth. The city of Portsmouth would have had an exhibit that would have been interpreted, and I think everybody would have been happy. Alternatively, the decision would have been made by everybody. No, it's best to leave it in the ground and let's interpret it in place. You know, one of the ideas that was talked about if they had left it in the ground is you could actually put signage up near its location with historic photographs and talk about it as the context. Why was it an important place? How was it important? And that that is still the sad part about the story is that never you never had that. And the lesson that hopefully uh, Steve Schaefer learns is that if he wants to do something, go through the proper channels, consult with people, just don't rush out and do it. And then after the fact, say, hey, look, I did this great thing for you all.